and cross my face and all over my body with the sign of the cross in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I believe and offer my supplication unto the Holy Trinity. I denounce Satan in the sight of the one holy universal apostolic church, and for this, our Lady Mary of Zion is our witness forever and ever. Amen. We give thanks unto the O God, and we adore thee, we bless thee, O Lord, and we put our trust in thee. We give thanks unto thee, O Lord, and we serve your holy name. We worship thee to whom all these bow. And cross my face and all over my body with the sign of the cross in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I think of my supplication unto the Holy Church. I denounce Satan to the inside of the one holy universal apostolic church, and for this, our Lady Mary of Zion is our witness forever and ever. Amen. We give thanks unto thee, O God, and we adore thee, we bless thee, O Lord, and we put our trust in thee. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, our paths which is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us and rescue us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Holy Virgin Mary, in the peace of the angel Gabriel, peace be unto thee. Thou Virgin and Spirit of Love and Body, O thou Mother, perfect God, peace be unto thee. Blessed art thou, most holy, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Rejoice, O thou who art full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Ask and pray for us, thy beloved Son, Jesus Christus, that he may have mercy upon our souls and forgive us our sins. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of the Father, who is with him before the creation of the world. Light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of one essence with the Father, by whom all things were made, and without him was not anything in heaven or earth made. Who for us man and for our salvation came down from heaven, was made man, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit, from the Holy Virgin Mary, became man, was crucified for our sins, and days of Pontius Pilate. Suffered, died, was buried, and rose from the dead on the third day, is written in the Holy Scripture, descended into glory, and died, and sat at the right hand of his Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. There is no end of his reign. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the life giving God, who sings from the Father, worship and glorifying with the Father, and the Son is called by the prophets. We believe in one holy universal apostolic church, and we believe in one baptism for the remission of sins and wait for the resurrection from the dead. Life to come, world without end. Amen, amen. So be it, so be it. The Holy Trinity, living God, have mercy upon us. Holy, 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 perfect Lord of hosts, heaven and earth are full of the holiness of thy glory. We worship thee, O Lord Jesus Christ, with thy good heavenly Father, the Holy Spirit, the life given for thou that is come and save us. All form worship to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All form worship to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All form worship to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Being one, he is three, and being three, he is one, he is three, in person, and one in God. Had to worship before our Lady Mary, whose virgin and spirit is well in body. I worship before the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, which is purified by his precious blood. The cross is our might, the cross is our strength, the cross is our ransom. The cross is the medicine of our souls. The Jews denied him, but we who believe in him are saved by the power of his cross. Glory be to the Father, glory be to the Son, glory be to the Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father, glory be to the Son, glory be to the Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father, glory be to the Son, glory be to the Holy Spirit. Glory be to our Lady Mary, Virgin and Mother of God. Glory be to the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let Christ remember us in his mercy and not neglect us in his second coming. Let him awaken us that we may thank his name. Let him make us firm in his worship. Our Lady Mary, lift our prayers, ask forgiveness for our sins. Before the throne of our Lord, to him who gave us his bread, for his mercy and Jewish forever. To him who gave us his cup, for his mercy and Jewish forever. To him who gave us our food and our clothing, for his mercy and Jewish forever. To him who gave us his holy body and his precious blood, for his mercy and Jewish forever. To him who has delivered us from death, for his mercy and Jewish forever. To him who has brought us unto the sour, let us give thanks unto the God, the most high, and let us give thanks unto our Lady Mary. And to his glorious cross, may the name of the Lord be praised and glorified. May the name of the Lord be praised and glorified at all times and every hour. We say salutation to you as we genuflect, O Mary, Mother of God, and we beseech you. We have taken refuge in you that you may deliver us from the hunting beasts, O Virgin, for the sake of your mother, Hannah, and of your father, Yakim, bless our congregation this day. My soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has regarded the lowest state of his handmaid, for behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done to me great things, and holy is his name, and his mercy is on those who fear from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his own. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their seats and exalted those of low degree. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. A hymn of praise, O my lady. Loose me from the bonds of Satan, O mother of the Savior and daughter of the light. Bless, sanctify, and cleanse me as you blessed your beloved Ephraim. A hymn of praise of Our Lady, the Holy Virgin Mary, which is to be recited on the fifth day of the week, Thursday.
The bush in the wilderness that Moses saw in fiery flames, the branch of which were not consumed, resembled the undefiled virgin Mary, the word of the Father was incarnated of her, and the fire of his God had did not consume the virgin after she had given birth to him. Her virginity was retained, and his divinity was unchanged, and the true God became human, and he came and saved us. Pray to him for us, O Holy One. Holy Virgin Mary, pray for us. We all magnify our Lady Field. We all magnify our Lady Field to go say that compassion may be upon us all. And the Virgin Mary, the Field to go is a part of us all. Because of her was removed the purple curse that set upon our race to the transgression that woman that the woman committed when she had ate of the tree. Because of Eve, the gates of paradise were closed, but because of the Virgin Mary, they have been opened for us once again. He allotted for us to eat of the tree of life, which is the body and precious blood of Christ. Because of his love for us, he came and saved us. What understanding, what speech, and what hearing can comprehend this marvelous mystery that is spoken about her. The Lord is a lover of humankind, and one alone is the word of the Father. He who was in his incorruptible Godhead before the world, the only Son came from one, the Father, and was incarnated of his Holy Mother. After she had given birth to him, her virginity did not perish, and because of this, she is manifested the Theotokos. Oh, how deep are the riches of the wisdom of God, the womb on which he had passed his judgment, that it should bring forth in pains, suffering, and sorrow of heart, has become the fountain of life, and without the seed of man has given birth to him, who removed the curse from our race. For this we glorify him, saying, Glory to you, O good lover of humankind, and Savior of our souls, Holy Mary, pray for us. Him for us, Holy One. Oh, how wonderful and marvelous is this power of the Virgin Theotokos' womb without seed. The angel who appeared to Joseph bore witness concerning this, and thus he said, He who will be born of her is of the Holy Spirit. He is of the Word of God, who was incarnated without change, and Mary gave him birth to him. Who, who is her twofold joy? Again, he said, You will bear the Son, and you will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Moreover, he will be called Jesus, for he, it is who will save his people from their sins, may save us with his power and pardon our sins, for we know for a certain, certainty that he is a God who became human. Glory to him forever. Oh, how wonderful is this nativity of God from the Holy Virgin Mary. She contained the word, she did not precede his birth, and her virginity did not perish but that with his birth. The word went forth from the Father without weariness and was born of the Virgin without pain. The wise men worshipped him and brought him incense, as he is God, gold for king, for he is king, and mirth, which was given for his life-giving death, which he accepted on our behalf according to his will. He is one alone, a merciful one, and the lover of humankind. Holy Mary, pray for us. Amen. Oh, how wonderful this is. He took a rib from Adam's side and fashioned a woman and the whole creation of humankind from it. The Lord, the word of the Father, was given, incarnated of the Holy Virgin, and called Emmanuel. Because of this, we supplicate her at all times to intercede on our behalf to her beloved Son. She was beneficent towards all the saints, the archbishops, for she brought to them that for which they had waited, the prophets, for she brought him concerning whom they had prophesied, the apostles, for she gave birth to him in whose name they preached in all the ends of the earth, and he he for whom the martyrs and the faithful contended went forth from her, Jesus Christ, the riches of the grace of his of his incomprehensible wisdom. Let us seek after the greatness of his compassion, for he came and saved us. Holy Mary, pray for us. The Lord swore to David in truth that the fruit of your body I shall sit upon your throne, and he shall not repent. When that righteous man accepted that Christ would be born of him in the flesh, he desired to see God and find a dwelling place for God the word. He completed this with great diligence and then cried out in the spirit, saying, Behold, we have heard in Ephrathah and the dwelling place of the Godhead of Jacob, which is Bethlehem, where Emmanuel has chosen to be born in the flesh of our, for our salvation. Again, another of the prophets said, But as for you, Bethlehem, land of Ephrathah, you shall not be less than the kings of Judah, for you will come forth a king who will shepherd my people Israel. All these words of those who prophesize in one spirit concerning Christ. Glory to him with his good father and the Holy Spirit, henceforth and forever. Holy Mary, pray for us. Pray to us for us, O Holy One. When the lawless rose up against David, who reigned over Israel, he longed to drink water from the well of Bethlehem. The captains of his troops rose up 
at once waged war in the camp of the lawless and brought him the water that he longed to drink. But when that righteous man saw that they had decided to deliver themselves to slaughter for his sake, he poured out that water and did not drink of it. Drink of it. Then righteousness and was accounted to him forever. Truly the martyrs just disdained the taste of this world and poured out their blood for the Lord's sake, enduring bitter deaths on account of the kingdom of heaven. Have mercy on us according to the greatness of your compassion. Holy Mary, pray for us. Pray to him for us, O Holy One. One of the Holy Trinity saw our lowly estate. He bowed the heaven of heavens, came and dwelt in the womb of the Virgin. He became human like us with the exception of sin alone and was born in Bethlehem. As the prophets proclaimed, he delivered us, ransomed us, and made us his people. Holy Mary, pray for us. We all magnify you, Our Lady Theotokos, that your compassion may be upon us all. The angels venerated Mary within the veil and said to her, Salutation to you, Mary, his young calf. The angel said to Mary, Receive the word. He will come to you and dwell in your womb. Oh, how he dwelt in the house of the poor, like the poor, desiring her beauty, descended upon her from the heavens and was born of her. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee, named Nazareth, to a virgin birth and to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel came into her and said, Rejoice, O joyful one, O full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she beheld him, she was troubled because of his words. In considering them, she said, How should one receive such a salutation as this? The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with the Lord. And behold, you will conceive and give birth to the Son, and you will call him Jesus. He will be great, and it will be called the Son of the Most High God. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this happen to me? Since I do not know a man, how can this happen to me? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit of God will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. He who is to be born of you is holy, and will be called the Son of the Most High God. And behold, Elizabeth, one of your relatives, has also conceived and received a son the in her own age and elderliness. And it is now the sixth month for her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible for the Lord. Then Mary said to the angel, Behold the handmaid of the Lord of all. Behold his handmaid. Let it be to me as you have said to me. The angel said to her, Salutation to you. Gabriel said to her, Salutation to you. O Virgin Mary, Salutation to you. O Theotokos, Salutation to you. O Holy Mary, Salutation to you. O Venerable Mary, Salutation to you. O Pure Mary, Salutation to you. O Joyful Mary, Salutation to you. O Beatific Mary, Salutation to you. O Blessed Mary, Salutation to you. O Dwelling Place of the Godhead, Salutation to you. O Fulfilled Tabernacle, Salutation to you. O Sister of Angels, Salutation to you. O Mother of All People, Salutation to you. O Our Lady Mary, Salutation to you. O Peaceful One, Salutation to you. The Most High sanctified you to be His dwelling place, Salutation to you. Those and glorified you to be His dwelling place, Salutation to you. O You who are clothed and adorned with golden garments, Salutation to you. O silver decked wings of a dove, salutation to you. O Mary, whose flanks are adorned with golden verdure, salutation to you. O Eastern Gate and Mother of the Light, salutation to you. You shine brighter, you shine greater than the sun, and are exalted above the mountains, salutation to you. O elect and glorious Mary, salutation to you. Praise to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that you may save us from the holy angels and the glory of the Father. When he, he says to the sheep on his right and the goes on his left, on his left, he, he set us on his right hand, receiving the martyr and John the Baptist, on his left, and the Lord is forevermore. Amen. May the prayer and supplication of Mary deliver us from the wrath of her son. May the prayer and supplication of Mary preserve our patriarch, Abraham Mokorios, and our patriarch, Abraham Matthias, from the wrath of her son. May the prayer and supplication of Mary preserve our Archbishop Baba Nathanael from the wrath of her son. May the prayer and supplication of Mary deliver the souls of the departed from the wrath of her son. 
May the prayer and supplication of Mary preserve the Christian people from the wrath of her son. May the prayer and supplication of Mary preserve our parish church, Devon of Iran, from the wrath of her son. May the prayer and supplication of Mary preserve our country, Ethiopia, and our country, the United States of America, from the wrath of her son. May all the intercession of the saints be with us and keep us in this day and all the days of our life and all peace. About that Shinhoi, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us and rescue us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Holy Virgin Mary, in the peace of the angel Gabriel, peace be unto thee, thou virgin, the spirit of God's in body. O thou mother of perfect God, peace be unto thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Rejoice, O thou who art full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Ask and pray for us, thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, that he may have mercy upon our souls and forgive us our sins. Good evening, everyone. How are you? Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and we're continuing our Bible study of 1 Corinthians. For the past few weeks, we've been studying 1 Corinthians, and we've been going chapter by chapter. Uh, this week, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and chapter 14 are the topic of our study. In the previous chapters, we learned a lot of different things about Corinthians. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it speaks about division within the church. One of the things that we talked about with that division was the idea that this is what we call a schism today. Um, back then, the church was divided between Paul, Cephas, and Apollo. Cephas meaning Peter. And so some people said they followed Paul, some Peter, some Apollo. Um, later on, then St. Paul goes, to, goes on to explain that the basic mysteries of the church are hidden in the wisdom of God, and that the wisdom of God is different than the wisdom of man. And he talks about how the Greeks and the Jews who were there at that time had denied God using the wisdom of man, but the wisdom of God had revealed to the apostles that they should preach Christ crucified. Uh, moving on then, we came up to chapters 4 and 5, and in chapter 5, we dealt with the topic of immorality. Chapter six, the body is the temple of God. And chapter seven dealt with the purity, holy matrimony, and maintaining purity throughout one's life, how it's not a sin to marry, um, and it's not a sin to maintain purity. Moving on to chapters eight, nine, and 10, there was food offered to idols. And then in chapter 10, St. Paul first mentions Holy Communion and the Holy Communion and what it means. In chapter 10, also, we gain some insight into how to interpret the Bible. Chapter 10, as I shared with you on that day when we studied it, it's a perfect example of how we're supposed to look at the Old Testament and use it to understand the New Testament. Um, in chapter 10, St. Paul mentions the Israelites in the Old Testament and how they were followed by a rock and he brought out that that rock was Christ. This means that the Old Testament had symbolic meaning of the New Testament. And the New Testament is the prophecy made clear. The Old Testament is the prophecy um, hidden and shrouded in the symbolic meaning. So St. Paul writes about that, and then last week what we studied was 11 and 12, um, and chapter 11 and 12 dealt with head coverings, and also covering, not only covering hair, but cutting hair for men, and it also dealt with a Holy Communion confession before taking Holy Communion, taking Holy Communion in a state of worthiness, and then uh, chapter 12 dealt with spiritual gifts. So this week we are up to chapter 13. Now the spiritual gifts that we studied last week were gifts of the Holy Spirit. And he talks about, St. Paul talks about the differences of administration. In other words, the Holy Spirit, once we receive a gift from the Holy Spirit, we administer it in different ways, but we're all part of the same body. 
And so in orthodoxy, what we emphasized was the idea of the body of Christ being a mysterious uh, body of Christ, not just a physical body, but a body that is looked at as a mystical body where all of us as human beings are in individual bodies, yet when we take Holy Communion, we become one. And so this shared communion that we have um, became the topic for chapter 11 and moved on to chapter 12. And so at that time, St. Paul was speaking to them about the gifts of the Holy Spirit because people started to rank Christians based on their spiritual gifts. Um, if we think about it from the perspective of the Corinthians, the Corinthians thought that people who had certain spiritual gifts were better Christians than others. And so if you had the gift of prophecy or the gift of tongues, they would say that that person had a special blessing from God, but the person who didn't, they weren't as worthy as the other. And so it's similar to today if people are looking for people in terms of uh, the power to heal the sicknesses of people. Um, and what we would say is that the person who has a gift of healing someone else doesn't have that gift of himself, but they have that gift of God. And so they're there to serve God with that gift. But it doesn't mean that God preferred that person anymore. But to clarify this, St. Paul introduces chapter 13. And so chapter 13 is one of the most widely known verses, um, chapters in the Bible, because it speaks about love. And as Christians, we all know that love is an essential part of Christianity. And so let's begin by doing a quick read of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love or charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Love being charity. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love envies not. Love wants, wanted not itself, is not puffed up. Does not behave itself unseemly, seeks not her own, is not easily provoked. Thinks no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. Bears all things, believes all things hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abides faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13 speaks about love. It also speaks about faith and hope. And these are behaviors or characteristics of what it means to be a believer. Believers have faith. Believers have hope. And believers have love. St. Paul says that the greatest of those is love. And so let's go back now to the first verse and look at an overview. In the first verse, St. Paul speaks about tongues 
of men and tongues of angels. So it's clear here that St. Paul is saying that the angels speak in one language and humans speak in other languages. And so the idea of angelic tongues and earthly tongues can often get us distracted. Some people get caught up in the question of, well, what language do the angels speak? Can I learn that language? Well, if we we're angels, we would speak that language. But St. Paul didn't mention it to us so that we could pursue that kind of path of thinking. St. Paul mentioned it, as I said before, because there were people who felt that if you spoke in tongues of men, you had an outpouring or a special gift. Now that comes from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter two. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit poured out upon the apostles and they all spoke in tongues. And they spoke in the tongues of different men in different languages all over the world. And because of that, in Corinth, the people believed that those people who spoke in tongues had more of a blessing. But St. Paul's point is to bring people to the essence of the faith. And his essence is that what it means to be a Christian is to have love. And so this should make us think about the words of our Lord when he said, love your neighbor as yourself. Greater love has no man than this, than he lay down his life for his brother. The kind of love that we're supposed to have, love of neighbor, love of our brother, is the kind of Christian value that is at the center and the core of the religion. And so it's not the love or the desire of things that we're supposed to be pursuing, but the love of each other. So let's take a minute and see what happened with the apostles right after the Holy Spirit descended upon them. In the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6, it speaks about what happened to the Christians, the early Christians. And... Let's see how the people gathered. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in daily ministration. Then the 12 called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, it is not reasonable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, Look ye out among yourselves seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip and Procurus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So they had to have some type of order in the early church because the number of people had grown. And the apostles found that the people were arguing with each other. They started to demonstrate that they didn't have love for each other. And so they established that the deacons, the first deacons would keep order and help people to have this communal love that they were supposed to have. Whether they were Greek or they were Hebrew, they were working together so that they could coexist. Now, one of the things that we have to see in Acts of the Apostles then is how the people came together in the very beginning. And they started to sell all of the things that they had and live communally. And so it says that in the Acts of the Apostles, uh, chapter 4, verse 32, the multitude of them that believed were of one heart, and of one soul. Neither said any of them that they, that ought of their things, any of their things which they possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. 
So this starts to help us to understand the type of love that St. Paul is talking about. He's talking about a love, a brotherly love that is one of sharing everything in common, not being selfish of possessions, but to make sure that everybody had their daily needs. So he begins in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 to explain to the Corinthians that it's not the Holy Spirit's gift of tongues that one should be really focused on, but that it's the spirit of love that is a gift from the Holy Spirit. And so he compares many spiritual gifts, and then he looks at them and says, but if it doesn't have love, what is it? Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. St. Paul says that he can speak in any tongue, but if he doesn't have love as a Christian, then it's just making noise. This means that preaching to people about the gospel without having love is not an effective way of spreading Christ's word. And so the people had to not just simply hear the words, but they had to see the actions of the apostles showing love towards other people. And he says then in verse two, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity or love, I'm nothing. Now let's think about the Old Testament for a minute. In the commentary of the Old Testament, we learn about the prophet Daniel. Daniel was a type of person who had the gift of prophecy and understanding of all mysteries, just like the Holy Fathers of the New Testament and after, who understood the mystery of the Holy Trinity and all the other teachings. Daniel had the gift of prophecy. Now just imagine Daniel the prophet being a person who was a prophet, but he was evil. If Daniel was a prophet and he did evil things, would he be famous within the church as a spiritual person? No. Daniel didn't fight back against the emperor when the emperor put him in prison or threw him to the lines. Daniel showed love. He was peaceful. And as a result, his prophecy was valuable. But if he had prophecy and no love, then it would be an unvaluable thing to speak about the future of Christ because he himself would go to hell. But those who heard his word would be saved. And so St. Paul is now making a comparison to those people who were prophets in the Old Testament. The prophets demonstrated love in addition to prophecy. And what was at the heart of what made them righteous people was that they had loving works. If they just simply prophesied, they would have been like the false prophets of Israel. And St. Paul then talks about not only a person who has knowledge of prophecy, but knowledge of mysteries. Once again, then he's talking about the mysteries of the church, the five pillars of mystery. And so he says, what benefit would it be if a person knew all the mysteries, knew all the teaching of the church, but didn't have any love? How could that be beneficial? He even gives an example that is similar to what our Lord says in the gospel. He says, if I have all faith that I can move a mountain. Our Lord said, if you have faith the size of this mustard seed, then you can move a mountain. And so our Lord, when speaking about faith, speaks about this tiny little seed. And if you had just that much, you could move a mountain. And St. Paul, in speaking about faith, says, if you have all faith and can move a mountain and you don't have love, you have nothing. 
and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. In other words, if I'm charitable, and though I give my body to be burned, like the three young men in the Old Testament who were thrown into the oven, and though I have not love, it profits me nothing. So St. Paul is trying to teach the Corinthians something, and he's also teaching us something at the same time. He's not talking about prophecy in general. He's talking about prophecy for the individual who is prophesying. If Daniel the prophet prophesied, but he didn't have love, he wouldn't get salvation. St. Paul is trying to teach us about our individual salvation. If we have all types of spiritual gifts, if we do all types of spiritual works, but we don't have love, then our salvation is void. Because our Lord said, love your enemies, love your neighbors, do good to those who do bad to you. And so if we fill ourselves with hate, then we're filled with darkness. He goes on to explain then, he said, love suffers long. Long suffering basically in Bible means patience. And so when we think about love suffering long, who do we think about? Job. Job was a man who had many children, riches, a family. His wife was a righteous woman. And then all at once, everything happened against his flesh. His children were killed. His wife became ill and died. His riches were taken from him. And throughout all of that, Job was long-suffering. He was what? Patient. St. Paul is trying to teach us that Christianity is not simply about being knowledgeable about Scripture or knowledgeable about the past. But Christianity is about our behavior. And so orthodoxy means to not only have knowledge, but to have the behaviors that go with it. Orthodoxy means not only strict teaching and doctrine of religion, but also the culture to live out those strict teaching and doctrines in a certain way. And so we have to think now about what St. Paul is teaching. He says that love brings about patience. It suffers long and is still kind. So this gives us the example of our Lord in the gospel. When he was on the cross, he said, God forgive them, Father forgive them, for they know not what they do. And so St. Paul says, love suffers long and is kind. This is the example that our Lord gave us in the gospel. In his own life, he showed us that we have to be able to suffer and be kind. It's not simply to suffer and then strike back, but to suffer and be kind. He says, love is not jealous of anyone, envies not, does not have envy. Love does not flaunt itself, is not vain. Love does not behave itself unseemly. Love does not seek its own. Love is not easily provoked and thinks no evil. St. Paul gives the Corinthians a series of things that they can think about in terms of Christian behavior. And today I want to list those things out. The first thing that St. Paul talks about for us is patience, being long-suffering. Patience is the first thing. Christians are supposed to have patience as a Christian virtue. The second thing St. Paul talks about is kindness, but he puts it up against suffering. He says, be patient and in suffering, be kind. And so patience is number one, kindness is number two. The third thing that 
St. Paul speaks about and teaches them in terms of Christian behavior is not to be jealous, not to be greedy or want other things. To be a person who denies himself, self-denial. The third thing that St. Paul teaches about is self-denial, not to be jealous or wanting of other people's things. The fourth thing that St. Paul teaches about in terms of Christian behavior is not to be vain, not to flaunt yourself. This means humility. The fourth thing is humility. And so we have patience, we have kindness, we have self-denial, and we have humility. He says, love does not flaunt itself, is not puffed up. Next, he says, it does not behave itself unseemly. Now, when we think about unseemly behavior, it's like showing a bad side of yourself in public, showing a bad side of yourself to people uh, because you're upset with something. This is something very important for us because in the society that we live in today, people feel justified to show themselves in a negative way if somebody's done something to them. And we as Christians should know that we should be decent. We should hide negative behavior. Even if it's a thought or something, we should put it down and not let it come out. Next, St. Paul says, she speaks not her own. Love speaks not her own. So when you speak of your own or for your own self, it's a sense of being aggressive does not um, having aggression mean that you start to advocate for yourself. And once again, this is in alignment with humility. Love does not get provoked easily and thinks no evil and does not rejoice in iniquity. When we think about all of these things that St. Paul is saying, we all have a lot of problems because most of us can be provoked pretty easily. We have people who know how to twist our buttons. And as Christians, the best way to avoid this kind of thing is by thinking before we act. He says that love does not rejoice in iniquity. You know, most people in society today, when they see something bad happen to a person, if they don't like the person, they find happiness in it. We're not supposed to be the kind of people who are happy in our enemies suffering. You know, this reminds me of a story in the book of Samuel. The prophet Samuel, when he heard that Saul the first king of Israel, had died. Even though Samuel had anointed King David and knew that God did not want King Saul to be the king anymore, Samuel mourned and was sad. Similarly, King David was sad when Saul died and was killed, and he held the person accountable who killed King Saul. The example for us as Christians then is for us not to be the type of person who rejoices in iniquity. That's what it means not to rejoice in iniquity. It means not to be happy when we see something bad happen to our enemy. So when we hear these stories from the Old Testament and we see these examples in the Old Testament, St. Paul is helping us to look at the Old Testament as an example for how we should live our lives. And when we look at what St. Paul is saying here about love, he's saying that Christian life and behavior requires us to have these behaviors 
and these virtues. We're supposed to be patient, kind, self-denying, humble, uh, behaving in a, a seemly way. Seemly means to appear in good behavior. Uh, all of these things are important. He gives love also an example of bearing all things, believing in all things, hoping in all things. It means that we have to be people who can bear a heavy load. We have to hope for things that God will give us. And so chapter 13 ends with, and now abide faith, hope, and charity, or love. Now, going back then to look at the word love in this chapter a second time, we learn about the different types of love that existed within the Greek society. And this was originally written in Greek. And the type of love that St. Paul's using in this chapter is translated charity because it is a type of love that they called agape love. And so the agape love is the type of brotherly love that the Christians had at the very beginning. When they started out in uh, Acts of the Apostles to live in common. They shared all things. And more than that, they shared the body and blood of Christ. And so in chapter 11, St. Paul speaks about Holy Communion. And then in chapter 13, he calls it and speaks about it as being a part of this agape, this sharing of not only a food, but a, a spiritual food, a spiritual life that they have together. And so the agape love is compared to other types of love. There's erotic love or eros, which is the love that we see mostly on TV, romantic love. And so this is the type of love where people are trying to give you the example of two people uh, romantically meeting and falling in love. Now, this type of love is typical in our society today. Then there's filial love. Uh, that filial love is really family love. Um, the family love, philia, is the family, meaning people typically love their brothers or their sisters, their mother or their father. And that filial love exists. And in Greek, there was that type of love. And then there's agape love. This is the type of love that you go beyond your physical brothers and sisters and have a spiritual brother and sister. And the spiritual brother and sisters are those who are members of the body of Christ. And so St. Paul speaks about agape love as being the most powerful type of love because he wants the Christians in Corinth to live together in brotherly love. In St. Paul's letters, he tells them, not to neglect the gathering together of each other. Let's look at where St. Paul says this in his letter to the Hebrews. In Hebrews, St. Paul writes about gathering together as Christians, and he says that the people should gather together frequently as the day is coming closer and closer. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, St. Paul says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting or encouraging one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is talking about agape love in a sense of the need for people who are Christians to gather. And the gathering is the giza or equivalent of mahabur. The concept of church 
for the word church, ecclesia in Greek, meant to gather together. And so did the word synagogue mean in Hebrew. And so the gathering together of the Christians was symbolic of their being one in the body of Christ. But they were one in the body of Christ because of something that was beyond symbol, which was they took the Holy Communion. And that was what Paul St. Saint, Saint Paul taught in chapter 11. Then he says in chapter 14, follow after love and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. For he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God, for no man understands him. Howbeit in the spirit he speaks mysteries, but he that prophesies speaks unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself, but he that prophesies edifies the church. So here we have two works of the spirit that St. Paul is comparing. And the problem was in Corinth, the people were highlighting the fact that there were people who spoke in unknown tongues. And those people were looked at as having spiritual gifts more than anything else. St. Paul teaches them that the core of their Christian life was that they have love. But if they were to think about a spiritual gift, they should prophesy. So let's try and bring this all into the context of our lives today. You know, a lot of times we get caught up with learning Muslim, doing Mahalat. Um, you know, studying languages like Giz and Amharic. Um, all of these things are knowledge-based. But if we do all those things, if we sing mesmore and we don't have love for each other, then the mesmore that we sing is empty words. If we study Giz language and do all types of kine, but as soon as we finish, we go out and we fight against each other, then our name means nothing. It's empty. It's just empty words being put on as a show. If we say mahile, and then at the end of the mahile, we fight with each other, or we disagree with each other, then it means nothing. The gospel teaches us that if we have a problem with our brother or sister, before we bring our offering to God, we should bring the offering and leave it at the altar, go back and make peace with our brother and sister, and then return and give our offering to God. This means that God will accept our offerings when we're at peace with each other, when we love each other. But if we are at odds with each other, then God doesn't accept our offering. And so St. Paul was explaining to them that love was necessary and they should follow after love. But if they had any spiritual gift, he wanted them to think about the benefit of speaking in tongue or the benefit of prophesying. And so prophesying and speaking in tongues are words that have special meaning to them at that time. To prophesy and speak in tongues meant to be able to reveal teachings about Christ. The prophets in the Old Testament spoke by the Holy Spirit about the coming of Christ. And there was still one thing that needed to be prophesied because the church teaches not only about Christ's incarnation, Mystera Sigawi, but also about Mystera Tensaha and so there were people who still prophesied about the coming day of judgment. And teaching and prophecy in this way meant that you taught people to correct their behaviors so that they could be judged righteous on the day of judgment. And St. Paul says that if the person were to practice prophecy within the church, that would edify the church and the person who's hearing. But if he spoke in an unknown tongue, 
in an unknown language to the other people within the church, then the only person that heard them was God. And so here now, St. Paul is trying to get them to understand that it is important to do spiritual work that is meaningful to the spiritual growth of the congregation of the body of Christ. He says in verse five, I would that you all spake with tongues, but rather that you prophesy. For greater is he that prophesies than he that speaks with tongues, except he interpret that the church may be received, receiving of edification. So if you don't have an interpreter for the tongues, then there's no edification. Nobody is benefited. So St. Paul says he wishes that people would have the spirit of prophecy more so than the spirit of speaking in unknown tongues. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? And even things without life giving sound whether a pipe or a harp, except they give a distinction and distinctive sound, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? Now, St. Paul is basically saying it's not only important because speaking with tongues uh, takes away the understanding of the person, but he says even if the person comes speaking in tongues, if they speak in tongues without speaking about something that is unrevealed, revelation, or something to give the person knowledge, or something that is prophecy or doctrine, then speaking in tongues is of no benefit. In other words, what's the purpose of learning and speaking in giz if the person is speaking about the life cycle of a bullfrog in giz? That doesn't have any meaning. And what St. Paul is basically saying here is that if the person doesn't speak about something like revelation or knowledge or doctrine of the church while they speak in tongues, what's the benefit? There is none. And so he compares that to an instrument playing that doesn't play a distinct note that everybody can understand. Now we've all heard musical instruments. If it's out of tune, nobody wants to hear it. And so he says speaking in Giz, for example, about the life cycle of a frog is equivalent to an instrument being played out of tune. It doesn't give a sound that anybody can understand or want to hear, especially within the church. Because what, what needs to be spoken within the church is prophecy, revelation, knowledge, and doctrine. For if the trumpet then in verse eight gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? So likewise you, except you utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For you shall speak into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world and none of them without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unable. I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. Even so you, for as much as you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church. Here is for us now a clear point to help us to understand what we should be doing as Christians today. Back then, the Corinthians wanted to have the spirit of tongues, the Holy Spirit revealed to them to speak in other languages. But St. Paul says, it's better to prophecy. He then says, it is better to prophecy because it edifies the church. It makes the church better. And so here now in verse 12, St. Paul says, Seek that you may excel in edifying the church, feeding the church, giving the church what it needs. For us as Christians today, us in UOTY, us working with you, 
all of us who are participating in these programs in English, what sense does it make for us to just simply do English, you know, programs that are not about spiritual things? We have to focus then on making sure that what we do in English is able to help benefit those who are within the church. And so we don't focus on just language, whether we focus on learning Giz or Amharic or doing different things that are from the tradition of the church. We focus on taking that tradition and bringing it into a language so that it promotes understanding and helps people to stay within the church and grow. If we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, this chapter speaks about the reason why UOTY exists. It exists because the purpose that we should have in terms of asking God for spiritual gifts is so that we can make the church stronger, make the youth stronger, bring people to the church and edify the church, not just simply be able to do things that are tradition, but to bring the tradition to people in a way that they can understand it so that they can then follow that pathway back to the tradition and learn more. St. Paul goes on to say in verse 13 then, wherefore let him that speaks in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the understanding also. Herein lies the reason why we have the prayer book in English, why we're translating uh, Mesmor into English, is so that we pray and understand. We sing and understand. And St. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 14. For I pray in an unknown tongue, for if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. I encourage everybody who is able to study in Amharic or in Giz to do so. But if you're praying in um, an Amharic and you don't understand it, I encourage you more to make sure that while you keep on studying and praying in Amharic, you get the English version and you study that and understand it as well so that your understanding is fruitful, not only your spirit understanding and spiritual life go hand in hand. This is what St. Paul is trying to teach the Corinthians. He says in verse 16, uh, at verse 15, what is it then? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the understanding also. Else when you shall bless with the spirit how shall he that occupies the room of the unlearned say amen at thy gave, giving thanks, seeing his understanding is not uh, what you say? Here, we have to understand the meaning of the word amen. Amen means truly. Uh, true is, so we say amen to say this is true. We believe that this is true. And St. Paul says, how is the person who's supposed to say amen at the end of the prayer supposed to verify that it's true if he himself didn't understand what was being said? And so it's important for us not to reject language and studying language. The Holy Spirit definitely gives us the ability, ability to study language, to understand different languages. What does St. Paul say? He says, if you have the ability to speak the language or speak in tongues, make sure you pray to God to give you the ability also to interpret it to others. And so this is how we should think. We should think about having the ability both to speak and interpret. And he talks about then the spiritual benefit and then the benefit of the understanding. And this, as I said to you, is one of the reasons why UOTY exists. For thou verily givest thanks, in verse 17, well, but the other is not edified. 
he basically says again, the person who says amen, says amen and is not benefiting from it, but the person who is giving thanks and praising God, he's saying everything, but there's no benefit on the other side of the receiving side. Think about this in terms of things like our liturgy. We say amen all the time in the liturgy. And if the people don't understand what's being said, how do they say amen? And that's one of the reasons why the first times the liturgy was translated in Tamharic in Ethiopia, because they wanted the people to be able to say amen and know what it meant. Nowadays, what we're doing is we're helping do the same thing in English. We're doing liturgy in English so that at the end, after the priest says the prayer, the people can actually truly say they understand and say amen. Verse 18 says, I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church, I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice, I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Now, St. Paul speaking says he himself knows many languages. And we know that he spoke Hebrew and Greek, um, at least those two, and possibly um, some Latin because he was a Roman citizen. And he says in here, a mystery, he speaks about five words where our church fathers say that these five words are the five pillars of mystery. So what St. Paul is saying, I'd rather explain the five doctrines that are essential to the church in a way that people understand it than to speak 10,000 words in another language that they don't understand it in an unknown tongue. Brethren, be not children in understanding. How be it in malice be ye children, but in understanding you be men. He always talks about to the Corinthians this idea of, you know, being children and men. And he talks about it in a way here where he's explaining that the Corinthians have reversed things. He says, brethren, be not children in understanding. The Corinthians were not worried about how much they understood what they were doing. But when you go back to chapter five, you find that they were worried about doing bad things. And so a child means the person is ignorant. To be childish and be, to have a childish mind means you don't know something. Children know less than adults. And he said that they were children in understanding. And he says, basically, don't be children in understanding. How is it that you can be children in understanding, but in bad things, in malice, you're not children? How be it in malice you be children, but in understanding be ye men? Basically, they didn't understand that they were doing bad things like we saw in chapter five in terms of the immoral behaviors, worshiping idols, eating idol um, food, worship to idols, um, you know, sexual immorality that they were practicing. They were ignorant like children of all these things. They were children in malice. They didn't know all the bad stuff that they were doing. But when it came to understanding, they act like they knew everything. But in fact, they were children in understanding because they didn't focus on the meaning. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. And yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serves not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. So here, St. Paul basically says, the gift of prophecy is supposed to be used within the church. But speaking in tongues was used on the day of Pentecost to make the people who didn't believe, believe, the outsiders convert. But on the inside of the church, understanding should be what prevails. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues 
and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that you are mad? But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believes not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you has a psalm, has a doctrine, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. It's important for us to realize the essence of what St. Paul is teaching here in Corinthians chapter 14. We as a church have to emphasize understanding. We have to make sure that everybody in the church understands what's going on so that they can fall down at the feet of God and repent. But if people come to church and they don't understand, how can they even repent of the sins that they committed? If God had spoken to St. Paul in an unknown tongue, how would St. Paul have known to repent of what he was doing? But God, when he spoke to St. Paul, St. Paul understood him and heard him. Therefore, he repented and changed his life. He went from persecuting the church to following the church. And so we have to make sure that the church is a place that is reaching out to people so that they convert and understand. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Let the prophet speak two or three and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sits by, let the first hold his peace. For you may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. As in all churches of the saints. So here we'll stop on verse 33. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. So if God is the author of peace, then the devil has to be the author of confusion. When we don't understand something, we can think to ourselves that it's the devil that's trying to keep us from understanding this mystery. The devil basically uses confusion to deceive us so that we do the wrong thing. So if we misunderstand something, what ends up happening? We start to be like Eve. We get tricked and deceived. And so the church is authored by God. And God wants us to have understanding. And when we have understanding, there is peace. So let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. What? Came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophecy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. So verse 34 here brings us to one of the most controversial issues for the church today. And that is the idea of women in the church. Now, when St. Paul speaks about women in the church keeping silence, he's not talking about conversation. He's actually talking about preaching. He's speaking in, in the sense that the women are not supposed to be participating in priestly actions within the church. And 
keeping silence, what he speaks to here is about the idea of women preaching. At that time in Corinth, it was clear that there was an issue in terms of the role of women within the church. And so St. Paul here speaks about women not being permitted to speak in terms of their teaching. And so here he says, they are commanded to be under obedience as also saith the law. So to, to clarify this point here, they're commanded to be under obedience as also saith the law. The law he's speaking about is the Old Testament. And what he's speaking about is the book of Genesis chapter three. And basically he, he's speaking about how Eve was made subject to Adam because Eve ate from the tree as a result, she was put under her husband. And so he uses this as an example to then explain why it is that men were given the role of teaching and not Eve. Um, for the sake of time, we're not going to go into this uh, subject this week. But what I promise to do is next week, we'll go into it in a lot more detail. Um, at other times, I've taught about the, the role of women within the church um, and explained in some, some more detail about this. So we'll go into this in a little bit more detail referring to different verses. But for that, um, let's summarize this uh, chapter 14 by really looking at what St. Paul was talking about in terms of increasing understanding within the church. He spoke about the role of language within the church and how the church is not supposed to be a place where we simply speak in unknown tongues to people, but that we encourage people through understanding. And that means that we should have interpreters and people who are translating. We have to say that our church is doing a much better job than it did in the past. Um, if you go into any church, there is uh, PowerPoint with the translations of the service up. Uh, most of the churches have this. From time to time, more and more, we're seeing church services done where the priest is reading the prayers in English and the chanting is done in Giz. Um, in this way, you can look at the PowerPoint. You can see the meaning in, in Giz and in English and in Amharic. And at the same time, you can hear the priest's prayer and say amen and know that you're saying it's true. And we're also seeing within the church uh, publications like the prayer book uh, translated from Giz into English, which was before only in Giz and Amharic. Now it's in English. And people are able to say the daily prayers in English. And so as we look at the work that's happening within the church, we see that it's following along the path that St. Paul wanted the church to follow at the time of Corinthians. We're supposed to be looking for understanding and in looking towards understanding, the church um, leaders uh, should promote making sure that everybody can understand in a language that is available uh, for them in terms of the one that they speak. So here we have the, the two chapters today, um, chapter 13 and 14. At this point, we will take a break from teaching and ask if anybody has any questions, you can put a question in the chat um, and raise your hand on the screen. Okay, uh, now go ahead. I can't really hear you. Uh, Can you hear me now? Perfect. All right. Um, um, so um, the question um, that I had was, there was... Um, I came I came across a person and um, at church, and we we had a conversation about speaking in tongues, mm. and um, they told me about uh, the Protestant ideology of speaking in tongues, and 
Um, it's still very shaky. I, start, I, I tried to look it up, and apparently there are various YouTube videos on how to speak in tongues. And so I just want uh, you to clarify as to what St. Paul meant when he said that. He said that multiple places. Yeah, so here in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, St. Paul makes it really clear um, in 13 that he's speaking in the tongues of men. So if he, if it was an unknown tongue, and in chapter 14, he says an unknown tongue to somebody, right? Um, it's clear that he's speaking about a language that is spoken by men. Uh, he's not speaking about a language that is unknown uh, to men. And so when he speaks about the gift of speaking in tongues in chapter 14 and in chapter 13, what he's speaking about is like, uh, you know, speaking in Giz or speaking in Amharic, uh, speaking in Spanish or speaking in Greek. Uh, he's saying, why would you speak in a language that people wouldn't understand you? Uh, his focus is on understanding because he says you can get an interpreter to bring about that understanding. So the biblical apostolic understanding of tongues is that they're speaking in languages that other men understand, and therefore you can use an interpreter. In terms of the Protestant church, um, I can't speak for the Protestant church, but uh, what I've seen is that there's the idea that they speak in a tongue that is unknown to men. And so that tongue that is unknown to men, while they, they speak it, um, there's no reference point or language that can be used as a reference point so that more than one person can understand it or that it's a common language to men. And so this idea is a char charisma or charismatic movement within the Protestant churches. Um, it's along the lines of uh, the first part of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. So the idea is, is that this is a, an angelic tongue that is not known by men and that they have an interpreter that can interpret and only that person and the other person are in the room and they can interpret this tongue. Uh, we don't follow that idea of tongues. Uh, the biblical apostolic concept of tongues is clearly outlined in Acts chapter two, when the Holy Spirit descended upon the apostles, they spoke in the tongues of all men. And so it wasn't that they were speaking a language that was unknown to man, they were speaking a language that was known to the men around them. And they said, how is it possible that these men are speaking our language? So for us, the apostolic teaching is that speaking in tongues means speaking in a known language of men. Does that help? Yes, it does. Thank you so much, Gassis. Um, All right. So we have um, a really... I think it's a good question. Um, you know, how do we control our emotions to become more loving? Um, you know, self-control starts out with your stomach. And I would say that it's important for everybody to realize that the church teaches us to start fasting at the age of seven because of that, that we start to develop self-control. And when we talk about controlling ourselves, um, first it's controlling our body. So human beings go through the stages of development where they, they, they go through learning bodily control. Um, you know, babies get potty trained. They basically know how to not go to the bathroom just freely. They know that when they have to go to the bathroom when they get the urge to go to the bathroom, they go and use a restroom. So, Throughout life, we learn self-control. It shouldn't stop right after we learn how to be potty trained. We should actually continue the practice of controlling ourselves. And so the next 
stage of self-control is when we have bodily urges that lead us to emotional outbursts. Um, it's very common to see it in commercials these days, but I love that Snickers commercial where the person is like usually a guy who, you know, is appearing like a diva, a woman who's throwing a fit because they need a Snickers bar. And then all the friends turn around, and they hand the person a Snickers bar and the person who takes the Snickers bar starts eating it. And then of course the woman disappears and it's like the guy who was sitting there and he's like, calm. But there's some meaning behind that. And it's very common knowledge to all of us. Um, what that means is that the person needed to have a Snickers bar and then he got control over himself. There are some kinds of bodily urges that lead to us, lead us to uh, have outbursts. St. Paul talks about this in so many different ways, but one place he mentions, your God is not your stomach. Now think about this. You know, fasting teaches us that our stomach is not God. We don't eat every time our stomach tells us to eat. You know, also, we don't eat every time our eyes see something that looks good. And so fasting helps us to train ourselves not to respond to our sensual urges, smell, taste, sight. We don't eat every time we smell something good. If you're full, you don't just go and eat it. And so we learn to control our emotions first through fasting. And once we learn how to abstain from the urges of food or the urges of our senses, we then can move towards our inner emotional control. You know, there's an expression people say, bite your tongue. Literally, you don't bite your tongue. I mean, you can bite your tongue, but that would be pretty painful, right? You'd bleed. But what it means to bite your tongue is to hold your speech. And so controlling your emotions to become more loving, after you start doing physical fasting from food, you also need to practice fasting from saying things to people. You train yourself not to say the first thing you think. Now, that should be pretty easy if you come from a pretty strict Habesha family, because usually you can't talk back to your parents. They have a fit. The first thing, you say something, then they're all over you. Practicing not to speak back to a parent was probably one of the first ways that people started to control the idea of speech. When you get older and you start to mature and you feel like you have individual rights and individual opinions, you living in a family unit with a mother and a father, initially you think, oh, I'm gonna say that. But then somebody immediately stops you, slaps you down. This goes to show us that the family is a structure that helps us to also develop self-control. No matter what we feel, we don't always get to say what we want to our parents, but we see that structure breaking down here in the United States. In America, you see Habesha kids who don't even respect their parents. And it's not just Habesha culture that we're talking about. We're talking about Christian culture. Christian culture is not just about righteousness or justice. Let's uh, go back a couple of chapters here um, in, in 1 Corinthians and look at what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Um, he talks about uh, there being quarrels among the believers, right? And in verse 7 of chapter 6, St. Paul says, Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you. A fault is a problem of, among the people. And because you go to law one with another, you, they sue each other. Why do you not rather take the wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be 
cheated by your brothers. Nay, you do wrong and cheat, and that you cheat your brothers. St. Paul is talking about this emotional control here. He says, you're supposed to practice allowing yourself to be cheated by your own brother. He says, it's better for you to do that than for you to go to court against your brother and your sister. Now, this is not, you know, the main point is not about going to court. The main point is, what does it take for a person to hold back from suing their own brother or sister, even if they have a right to do so? It requires that they have a willingness to suffer being wronged. And so when we talk about biting your tongue with your parents, even if you're right, you should have a willingness to suffer being wronged. And so as you talk about or ask this question of how do you control your emotions to become, become more loving, that is at the essence of the deeper spiritual side of things in fasting. The ability to suffer wrong, even though you're right. This is what we see on the cross. Our Lord suffered wrong for other people, even though he was right. So Ruth, I left, um, it's important for us to realize that we are supposed to practice being wronged. Not that we go out and look for people to, to wrong us, but that we are forgiving. And so forgiveness at the essence of forgiveness means that we don't have to be right. There's another lesson that I have taught um, to some of my spiritual children, and that would come from 1 John chapter um, 2. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 uh, and 16, uh, St. Paul talks about the love of the world, and he says, love not the world. But then he goes on in verse 16 to say, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father. A lot of times why we don't want to be wrong is because we have the pride of life. The pride of life really speaks about our need to be right. You know, people often want to be right even if it brings about the hurt of somebody else. And this is because we have pride. People will say, oh yeah, he was right about that. You know, we have another expression that goes along with that and it's like, I told you so. I told you so means the pride of life. You get to be right in the eyes of other people. But we as Christians have to focus on this emotional control so that we know that we are right in the eyes of God. And therefore, it doesn't matter if we're right in the eyes of people. So practice this. Practice being right in the eyes of God and not in the eyes of people. In fact, if your parents say something to you, bite your tongue. It means don't be right in front of your parents. Don't have to be right. Don't try and be smarter. Don't try and be better. Don't try and be the one in control but try and practice being right in the eyes of God. Because you have to ask yourself, does God want the child to humiliate the parent? If you look at the relationship between our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his father, is there any disagreement between them? And so this is to show us how we should live our lives. So I hope that was a little uh, helpful for you, uh, Ruth and Aleph, uh, whoever had put down that question. Um, are there any other? Is that a second hand, Nahum, or you forgot to, to, to put down the other one? Um, no, it's the second hand. Um, okay. So it was just the, the, the question that Ruth, Ruth and Aleph asked, uh, it warranted another question. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've read a lot of quotes from church fathers 
um, which begs the question, do I need to like someone for me to love them? <laughs> yes. You know, it's, it's a nice question. Um, do you need to, to like someone to love them? You can't love someone if you don't like them. You can't say you, don't, you love someone if you don't like them. And so the question that I would raise is, what does liking someone really mean? Um, I think that the Bible teaches us a different uh, way of thinking of things, and that is respect. Uh, there's a difference between respecting someone and liking them. And the respecting part is, is rooted in love. Um, you can respect a person's humanity so that you wouldn't dehumanize someone. Um, and I think that that's more important than what people talk about in terms of liking things. Uh, people, for example, talk about liking the way the person dresses or treats them or talks to them. Um, it's the idea that you would never want someone to have something happen to them that you wouldn't let happen to yourself. Respect is more um, along the right lines. So in order to love someone, you have to respect them. And respecting them doesn't mean that you have to have 100% agree with, agreement with them all the time. Um, it means that you don't use foul language with them. That's respecting them because you don't want foul language used with you. Um, it means that you don't bring harm to them because you don't want harm brought to you. Uh, there are so many things that are important for you to make sure that you, you do in terms of other people that really mean so much more than just liking them um, personality-wise. It's respecting them. And so respecting them um, is probably what you have to do in order to love someone. I don't think you can love someone that you don't respect. Does that help? Yes, it, it does. It does. Thank you so much, Cassis. Do you have a follow up to that, though? I can hear in your voice. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do, but I, I, we can we can talk out. We can talk at a different time. I feel All like right. I just Give huh? follow up. <laughs> no, it's just like okay. So, uh, there might be people. I feel um, a lot of us might have had fallouts with uh, some people or just essentially not really syncing up with them in general. And um, and I, I feel like I'm asking more so for the people that we have fall, uh, fallen out with. Mm. Um, it's very difficult to like find respect for that person, especially after everything that we've gone through, if that makes sense. Um, and how can we rebuild that? If, if that, how can we re rebuild to a point where we're um, loving them in a Christian sense? Well, I, I think that this is, it's good. I'm glad you did the follow-up because I think Ruth's, um, and I left a question, whoever posted that, um, helps us to understand this. The problem with liking and disliking people has to do with emotions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the Christian has to get to the point where he overcomes his or her emotions. Can you agree with that? Yes. Oh, yeah, I can. So... If, if you understand that Christianity is not being an emotional train wreck, which is what most human beings are right now, um, they're just emotional about things. They call it being passionate, but you know, Christianity practices this idea of dispassion. Um, when you think about the teaching of the, the church fathers and passions, uh, the, the Eastern Orthodox church fathers always talk about dispassionate life because they say that the emotions were corrupted at the fall of Adam and Eve. And I can agree with that somewhat because, you know, when we think about anger, it's really turned towards the wrong place. Anger is turned towards each other as opposed towards the devil. Um, and so 
we just look at our emotions and we see that our emotions make us very volatile. Mm -hmm. And so I think that people these days have to strive to overcome this emotional state. And at the essence of all of this emotion is probably what people consider relationships. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, agape love and filial love and then eros love. And when people think about male and female relationships, um, they basically get all romantic. But they don't focus in on the brotherly love that is behind it. And I think for young Ethiopians who are within the church here in the United States of America, you guys have a perfect example. You have cultural examples of what you're supposed to be doing in terms of how to love a brother and a sister. Um, and you have to make sure that you don't corrupt that with this American culture. I remember the first time I always joke about it, you know, um, you know, soldiers walking down the street in Ethiopia holding hands, guys with AK-47s on their backs, you know, best friends. And they're not ashamed of brotherly love. Um, you know, filial love and family love is, is very much uh, akin to agape love. But brotherly love is this idea of embracing the humanity of a person, just being a companion to be in their company and to be happy. Mm -hmm. I think that the problem comes when you have fallings out with people because you're trying to have these relationships that are filled with uh, mixed emotions or the wrong emotions. Um, we call people friends and you know, friends are people who make you what? Feel good about yourself. And if you, they don't make you feel good, then all of a sudden you don't call them a friend. And so ultimately we displace all of these things and we, we look for these emotions or these, these, uh, these behaviors from people who are not supposed to be giving them to us. If we need to feel love, we need to feel God's love. And the question is, well, how do we know that God loves us? Well, if we follow his commandments and he you know, um, and we do as he's his teachings, then St. Paul talks about it today in 1 Corinthians. He says, God is not the author of confusion, but the author of peace. God will give us peace. That's how we know God loves us, because we have inner peace. And so God gives us a sense of inner peace, just like we're looking for friends to give us inner peace. You don't need inner peace from somebody that you don't know. You can't get your peace from other people. You have to get that peace from God. And I think that that is at the root of the problem because relationships that we have are all corrupted. You know, God is not at the center of the relationship. Therefore, hate develops. Envy develops. Jealousy develops. You know how many people are jealous and then they end up falling out with people? Oh, so-and-so likes him. He shouldn't be like that. He shouldn't like him. I'm going to try and make them not get along with each other. These are things that happen all the time. And so, you know, part of the process of uh, maturing in Christian life is going back, repairing relationships that are coming from your fallenness, from your emotional state, and bringing them, those relationships into a mature Christian state, which is one of mutual respect. And you're not looking for something back from that person. You're not looking for that person's feedback or opinion about you. That's not what you need in order to make you feel good about yourself. You have to know that you have, you have self-worth in and of yourself from God. And so to, to look for that and to find that, you have to be like Abraham who had faith. Abraham believed God. And so when you read the book of Psalms, if you believe what King David says, that God loves you, and God is with us, and God is helping us, and that he heals us, all of these things are spoken about in the Psalms. When you have faith and believe the things that you read in the scriptures, then all of a sudden, 
you start to feel that inner peace. And so it says in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 18, Abraham was a friend of God. So we look for all of these things in the wrong place. And I think that that's why it's hard to repair those relationships because we still want to have these faulty relationships. We want to have romantic relationships with uh, the opposite gender uh, because we think that that's the way it's supposed to be. We've been deceived to believe that the agape love doesn't apply to a husband and a wife, but it does. And so, you know, I would say to you guys, you know, you want to work on that perspective, um, work against those emotional states, try not just be emo to be emotional about things. If you get into an argument, be willing to be wrong so that you can make peace. It's better to be wrong and make peace than to be right and have war. It's just common sense. Um, but it, it's a question of what do we value? Any other questions? Thank you so much, Kasis. That was very sufficient. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mel. Other questions? Um, yes. Sorry, uh, I have a question. Um, my question is about humility. I know that if we want to like disregard like our need to be right all the time and stuff like that, we need to have humility within us. So how do we become more humble? Is that like also with fasting and stuff or not? It's a, it's a good question. Um, you know, humility is an interesting word because at the root of it, there's also another word, humiliate. Um, and so St. Paul talks about humility in two places and he talks about it in chapter 13 and he says, um, love vaunteth not itself, flaunts not itself, is not puffed up. To humiliate somebody is to make them look bad, right? Um, if you were in school and some and everybody, you know, like somebody tripped you and you fell in front of everybody, you would feel humiliated. Um, humility, being humble, also comes from the same word. It's the concept of not needing to look good in front of everybody else. That's being humble. And then humiliated means to, to be made to look bad in front of other people, right? So the meanings are very similar and they come from the same concept. And so the question is, you know, how do we gain humility? Um, and a big part of that, you know, the church fathers talk about this, and this is more in the ascetic fathers, um, you know, one time, I think Deacon Nati and I were talking about this. Uh, we were reading from the Book of the Saints on one morning in church. And there was a, a bishop who had been struggling with lust all his life. Nobody knew it. He was a bishop. But from the time he was young until he was older as a bishop, he had been struggling with lust of the flesh. And so he constantly prayed to God and prayed to God to overcome this lust and this desire of his flesh. And it says that what he did in order to overcome that was that he went around at night and cleaned the bathrooms of the other monks. Now, obviously, monks don't have bathrooms, do they? So they had outhouses where they basically went out and built a little wood shack around it and dug a hole. And they did their, um, they used that as their bathroom. They defecated, whatever you want to call it. They, they used it as a bathroom. Obviously, what was there? It smelled. It was disgusting. Each night, the bishop would go around and he would clean out their outhouses. And they would come back every day and they'd find it clean. Why the bishop did this was the church fathers in the Book of the Saints say that by humiliating himself, he destroyed the spirit of lust within him. And, you know, the idea is like, if you are all romantic and googly eyed over somebody that you see in school, and the person sees you and is like, oh, you're ugly, I hate you in front of everybody else you wouldn't have any lust anymore. 
you would just be humiliated. And so when you think about then how to develop uh, humility, it's actually the same way that you, you develop it when somebody embarrasses you in front of other people, but bringing that on to yourself, not making yourself high above what God wants you to be. And so, for example, um, you know, for deacons and priests, I'll give the example for, for deacons and priests because I'm a priest and there are lots of deacons. Um, it's really important for us not to get used to being served. I always talk to our deacons about that. Deacons, according to Acts of the Apostles, chapter six, are supposed to serve other people. The apostles said, oh, we're not supposed to be here um, serving tables, but we should be about the word of God. So that gives us the example of what a deacon is supposed to do, serve tables. Why did the deacons serve tables? Not because they weren't capable of preaching the gospel, but when they were serving the tables, they would also bring about peace between the people who were disagreeing with each other at the table. They were there to oversee people when they were most volatile for fighting. When was that? When they gathered together to eat. They would fight over who got served first. The Greeks would say, our women didn't get served. The Hebrews would say, ours didn't get served. And so people are most volatile in situations when they're talking about their basic bodily needs. And so they would fight over these things. The deacons were then given charge over serving the tables because when they served the table, they would make sure that they served everybody equally and fairly. And this was the fruit of the Holy Spirit that they didn't just look to the people that they cared about. They, in fact, looked to the people they didn't know, and they realized that they needed to create equality within the church. Deacons and priests have to practice things that make them humble. You know, I always fight with people over trying to carry my stuff. I'm a priest. In our church tradition, I can't hardly carry things. I should. In fact, I should try and help other people. So how do we develop that humility? You know, it's not typical of us to go and say to our brothers or sisters, oh, I'm gonna clean your room. It's instead we say, you know, you need to clean your own room. You made a mess. But when we clean up after other people, how many of us can clean up after our brothers and sisters and keep our mouths shut about it? We clean up after somebody and then we go tell them, look what I did for you. <laughs> Well, we lose the credit. We don't even get the credit with God when we do it that way. So if we want to develop the humility, you know, try and do something good without trying to get credit for it or saying to the person that you did it. Just be the person who does something good in secret and God will bless you openly. This is Matthew chapter six. If we do something in secret, God will bless us openly. So I think that developing humility um, comes the same way as it does in terms of being humiliated. We lower ourselves. Humility means to lower yourself. To be humiliated means somebody else lowers you. And so what we have to do is find ways to lower ourselves. You know, it's serving other people, helping other people. Um, and this is how we develop humility. Humility is, it's a, it's a virtue. It's a character trait that can be seen in people when somebody says to them, you know, oh, you, this guy, he's really important. But when you see the person, they're really down to earth and they never put themselves up there to be important. So Ruth, that's how I would say you, you start to do it. You know, think of the story of the bishop who basically went around doing things that were not um, of his stature. They were below his stature, but he did those things in order to extinguish mm -hmm. desires within himself. And in so doing, he replaced the lust of his flesh with the humility of the spiritual life. Okay.
Okay, and we have some questions in the the chat. So how do you become more patient? How do you trust in God? Um, it's not an off topic question. I think it's important. Um, you know, patience is basically means to wait, right? Uh, to, to wait for something. And, you know, often we don't practice uh, waiting very well. So I would start off with this one simple practice. Before you do everything, just count 10 seconds. Did you see how long that wait was? You know, just by counting 10 seconds, we start to slow down the process so that our thinking can catch up with our actions. You know, patience is about being able to um, wait for things to happen. Uh, there is a spiritual virtue called postponement of gratification. To postpone gratification, to gratify means to be satisfied. To postpone satisfaction means to wait. And there are a lot of things that require postponement of gratification or patience. Raising children requires patience. You know, people have children and then they have to wait 21 years to see what the fruit of their work is. To raise a child means you have to exercise patience. You never know what they're going to be like until you actually do this for a period of 20, 21 years. And so there are a lot of basic things in life that require us to have patience. And at a young age, one of the things we have to do is just practice putting time between our actions and our thoughts. And so you think something, wait 10 seconds before you act on it. In that 10 seconds, what you can also do is think about whether you should do it or not. And so practicing to put time between thought and action creates patience. Because the first time you act on this, and you put some time between your thoughts and your actions and something then happens and you change your mind because you realize something else, that's when you start to realize that, wow, this patience thing can actually work. It can bring some benefits to me. And so a lot of times what we have to do is wait, put down some time in between our thoughts and our actions. That's the first step. The spiritual side of that is patience in the sense of waiting for what God has to give us. Patience in that sense requires a bit of faith because you have to believe that something good is going to happen. And what I've learned is that the first time you believe that God is going to give you something and you wait and you see it happen, you develop more and more patience after that because the truth is God is real. And when we ask for things that we need, God actually gives them to us. So ask for the right things. Don't ask for things to satisfy your pleasures, like God give me a million dollars, God give me a big house, God give me a nice car, God give me a nice job, you know? But ask for things that God can give you, like God give me a heart to help other people who are less fortunate than me. God give me the resources to feed the poor. God give me the resources to shelter the homeless. If you ask God to give you those things, he can give them to you abundantly. But if you're asking God for all these other things, you won't even see it because, you know, God doesn't usually give it to us. So ask for things in the right way and then wait to see God give them to you. And then what happens is you develop more and more patience. And the same thing goes with trust in God. Okay. Well, 
Okay. Do we have any other questions? I think we're close to our, yes, we are close to our end time. Um, so we studied 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and 14, and we are coming to the close of our study of Corinthians next week, uh, Wednesday. Chapter 15 um, is a big chapter. It teaches about the resurrection of the dead. And so we will look at chapter 15 and 16, which are built on um, some very big concepts, um, physical charity to the, to the church and the resurrection of the dead. And so I thank everybody for joining us this week. I hope that this uh, study has been beneficial to you. Those of you who are watching us on YouTube, we've been putting it on YouTube now so that people can go back and study it. Um, the questions are great. They really help us a lot. And I hope that those who are watching also benefit from it. Um, we have a question about online resources uh, for the EOTC calendar, liturgy, et cetera, in English. Um, we are actually working on updating the UOTY website so that it can have resources. And so what I will say is keep an eye on our resources um, on the UOTY website. There are other um, websites that have a lot of material, but they may not be that easy to find. Um, I have enjoyed ethiopianorthodox.org. Um, in terms of its resources, and I would look at that, um, ethiopianorthodox.org. Um, the prayer books, I have, as I told you guys, uh, some people have been asking about it. Uh, we are going to try and put it up on the ULT, our website as well, so that people can make the purchases. I was out of town for a while. I just came back. Uh, I know that new prayer books were printed. Um, those of you who are interested in it, uh, Ruth and others who were there, I will just type in uh, an address for you guys, and then we will be making announcements uh, live for other people so that they can uh, find out about it. Uh, just send a message to this, those of you who are live right now. So I put that up for you guys to email me. And those of you who are interested in other places, we are definitely going to make that widely available to you. Uh, we haven't set up the system yet, but within the next week, we will have the system up and running and we have the books printed. So thank you very much for uh, being there to support us. Um, uh, Ruth uh, just said that there are some resources on yotc.org as well uh, for the prayers and liturgical practices. So if you're interested, the YOTC, the Young Orthodox Tewahedo uh, Youth uh, Program in Washington, D.C. has a website, yotc.org, and uh, Kesis Abai and Deacon Dawit our brothers uh, have put those resources up and you can look to their website as well for those resources because they have wonderful resources as well. So I hope that has uh, helped all of you. Uh, those of you who are watching tonight, um, Deacon Gregorios will be on Thursday uh, night, I believe, uh, doing live and Deacon Ephraim was on yesterday. Uh, we've committed to try and make uh, live presentations available to you guys, and that way there will also be resources on our YouTube page. So God bless you all. Thank you for joining us, and let us close with prayer. I cross my face and all over my body with the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I believe and offer my supplication. To the Holy Trinity, I denounce Satan in the sight of the one holy universal apostolic church. And for this, Our Lady Mary of Zion is our witness forever and ever. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we ask you to bless all of us and protect us from all evil. Keep us in safety and peace and bring us back to serve your holy name in the next week during this conference so that we may learn the word of God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done.
have begun their offenses in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Holy Virgin Mary, in the peace of the angel gave him, peace be unto thee, thou virgin, the spirit of God's own body, O thou mother of us. Peace be unto thee. Blessed art thou most woman, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Rejoice, O thou who art full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Ask and pray for us, thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ. That he may have mercy upon our souls and forgive us our sins. May the blessing of the Father and the love of the Son and the gift of the Holy Spirit be upon me and all of you. God bless you all. Have a good night.